the marriage isn't what I thought it would be, or it's a big fat problem to I'm ready to leave is this enormous journey that really takes place between our ears and as we travel down to our heart. And it could take months, it could take years. And that is the beginning of the journey because there's so much we have to untangle and dismantle so that we can be calm, clear, and confident and so that we can then actually be effective and productive in the divorce process itself. Hey, midlifers, welcome to the Midlife Makeover Show. Are you ready to break free from your mundane midlife? Are you feeling trapped in a vicious cycle of rinse and repeat days? No matter if you're experiencing a divorce hangover, job burnout, or you just have the midlife blues, I got you. Hey, I'm Wendy, your hostess of the Midlife Mostess. I too was hit by midlife like a freight train. I too felt stuck in the same dull chapter. I wanted the clarity of how to create a new life beyond divorce and the courage to leave an unfulfilling career. But I kept telling myself that I wasn't worthy and it was just easier to stay in my comfort zone until I found a little secret, the freedom to live my life my way. In this podcast, you will learn how to achieve a vibrant midlife mind and body, how to create solid relationships through love and loss, and how to create an awesome second half of life. Grab your grande latte, pop in your earbuds, and let's get this midlife party started. Everyone, welcome back to the Midlife Makeover Show. Yes, I'm giggling already. I've already been talking to our guest for like 30 minutes. We have so much in common, uh, including the topic um, that we're going to be discussing today. And that topic is actually, I don't know if you know this, Karen, but it's one of my most um, top downloaded episodes on the show. Besides menopause. <laughs> so it's either menopause or divorce. Da, da, da. Two rubs. <laughs> but you know what, though? I mean, just like menopause, they're finally freaking talking about it. They're finally bringing light to what is considered to be a dark subject. But we can handle menopause. We can handle divorce. Um, so everyone, today's guest, Karen McMahon. She is a high-conflict divorce strategist certified divorce coach and founder of Journey Beyond Divorce. Such a great name, by the way. Uh, she began divorce coaching in 2010 after recognizing that the pain of her divorce led her on a transformational journey into a powerful and unexpected new life. And you have slayed it, my dear. Karen leads a national team of divorce coaches in supporting men and women around the world to become calm, clear, and confident as they navigate divorce. Karen is the host of the acclaimed Journey Beyond Divorce podcast and co-author of Stepping Out of Chaos, Turning Pain to Possibility. By the way, Karen is a returning guest. She was on episode 22, which is, let's see, I think today's is going to be 100, and, what did I say, 143? 143 minus 22, that's a hundred and what is it? 120. What? 121. Hey, wow, you've been a busy girl. Yeah. So <laughs> I know today's episode is going to be epic, but you can also check out divorce. Uh, divorce got you down. Three ways to feel better and recover from divorce. Episode 22. Karen, welcome back. It's Thank you so much for inviting me back. Love being here. With you. Yeah. So uh, for those that are meeting you for the first time, tell them a little bit about your backstory, your divorce story. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I married late. I was 34. I was crazy in love, thought I was just the luckiest woman around. And uh, by the time my children were actually two and four, things had already begun to unravel. And uh, I've actually been writing my story because of this event that I have coming up. And I think what I would say is the early stages of uh, realizing that you're in a very unhealthy or toxic mm -hmm. uh, marriage, your your logical mind is trying to figure out, I'm a pretty smart person. Why can't I, why can't I figure this out? Why is this so hard? 
And back then I didn't know about trauma and personality disorders and what have you. So uh, my kids were four and six when I told them I was leaving dad. I had to spend three and a half years in the attic because I couldn't leave or he was ah. the kids. And uh, CPS was involved. The police got involved in order of protection. I had no money. I lost all of my business. I was a full, fully commissioned salesperson. Friends were bringing food to the back door. And and then I finally called my attorney and said, I have to leave. <laughs> I need wow. to move out. And moving out uh, was, it happened in, I found the place on Mother's Day 2006, moved out June 1st. And it was like a hippopotamus left my chest. It was just, even though the divorce wasn't completely done for another six months, moving into a home that was mine with my kids uh, felt like someone broke me out of a third world prison. And it was, it was, I would say two things about my divorce journey. One is it was hellacious. Mm-hmm. My favorite saying was this too shall pass, which I was thinking works. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, we talked actually, about right? that <laughs> I but, do remember that from last year. We both were like, yep, that this too shall that, pass. That yeah. was, that was like my life raft. It was my yeah. mantra. And, uh, and, and yet as, as, incredibly difficult as it was, it, it was a fire of refinement. And I felt like I emerged such a healed and refined version of who I was going into it that Mm. I was really struck by how those years had changed me for the better and, and obviously led me down this path. Isn't it interesting though, when you look back and I'm sure even now, like you were talking, which we'll talk about your summit too, but as you're kind of reliving the past right now, isn't it interesting to see, to, to, to imagine that person that you once were during that time, yeah. if you could go back, like if you could talk to her right now, the Karen back then, what would you tell her? Oh, I'm I'm getting teary eyed. Um, mm-hmm. I I would tell her you are uh, stronger, wiser, and more capable than you have any idea of, and um, and don't listen to any of those things that have been said about you. And you go forge your way because you have a beautiful life to live. Yeah, you're gonna make me cry too. <laughs> Yeah, it's like when I asked that question, I was thinking about myself. I was like, oh my gosh. It's like looking back for me and how much I lost of myself. And I would go back and say, like, and it took me a long time. And you lived in the attic, I lived in the basement. <laughs> At least, but the good thing is it was a lookout basement. So at least I had a little bit of sunlight. <laughs> but it took me the longest time to get out of that marriage. And so what's interesting between the two of us, my marriage was actually, it was okay. It was fine. And so, but what woke me up was there was one day I was in uh, San Diego. I was doing a heal your life workshop training, the Louise Hay. Yeah. And we had a breakout in partners, you know, and this lady said to me, she goes, the hardest thing I've ever had to do was to divorce a good man. I was like, oh shit, that's me. So it wasn't that he was like this horrible man. He was an, um, he's an amazing father, but he wasn't for me. And with all of my, with the weaknesses I had, it he it was like that kind of codependent relationship that it helped me helped me that says i kept my light very very small in that relationship in order for wendy to shine i had to get out of that and i i think like i i i confused contentment with complacency i just fell into this nice little comfort zone of complacency. And then I would rationalize it. So it's interesting sometimes. Yeah. It's interesting to hear the story of like a horrible relationship, horrible marriage, and like an okay one, a media, you know, mediocrity, right? I would argue that <laughs> it's harder. 
in a heartbreak kind of way, it's almost harder to divorce a good someone where it's like, you know, we yeah. just, you know, I, because especially if you're, if they feel really hurt by it. Yes. So I was just like, you can't call me one more nasty, bad. Yeah. Name. You can't mm. like, I was so, I was so broken and beaten down. And yet my inner wisdom knew that, you know, there is nothing right about this. And so yep. the time that I said I was leaving and he sobbed his eyes out, I was like, screw you. You know, like I was just like, I had no compassion. Yeah. Whereas when I work with people and they're leaving good men and good women, yeah. there's a heartbreak about that. That's yeah. very different, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, is divorce challenging? Yes. Is it the worst thing in the world? No. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Hell yes. And sometimes the tunnel is just much longer than you had hoped it would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> I have, what, I have, what? I have, I was three and a half years. I have a client who's got a 12 and 13 year old children and she's been in the process for over eight years. So they were like four. Wow. Yeah, so, so there's, I mean, when you get into high conflict, and they're not all like that. You can have a six yeah. month high conflict mm -hmm. divorce, but uh, because of just the shenanigans and what you're dealing with, it it is often a much longer. Uh, yeah, longer I, don't know about, I don't know about you, but like since you have a podcast and it's like you meet so many people, I, I feel like the one thing we all have in common, we're all like our own guinea pigs. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> we <laughs> we learn and then we teach what we've learned. Yeah. And like from our breakdown to breakthrough, then we're able to go, Hey, this is how you do it. You know? So what inspired you to go into helping others go through divorce? You know, when I emerged from my divorce, uh, I fully commissioned and I was, I was in print sales. So if anybody mm -hmm. knows anything about print sales, it's like, it's, it's the dinosaur industry, you know, yeah, I, know. When I was in it. It was like people printed newsletters. There was no mm. colored printers on the desk. There was no PDFs. They were like, you had to print everything. So commercial yeah. printers were, but it was rapidly changing. And so, and I had gone through this personal transformation and I remember thinking, okay, I have a whole different lens of life and somehow I can't believe that I've been put on this green earth to sell ink on paper. It just doesn't, it falls pretty flat right now. There's got to be something more important. Uh -huh. So that's, that was my starting point is there has to be something more important. And I had worked, um, I had actually, uh, mentored with a life coach for a small amount of time, but talk about mindset. Great guy. Helped me a little mm -hmm. bit with the divorce. I would do some marketing for him. And I love the idea of coaching, but mm -hmm. my mindset was there is no way I will ever make the kind of money I make in sales mm -hmm. doing that. And so I kept shutting the door and walking away. And, and I got to a point where um, I really needed to leave the industry. And I called him and I said, could I just do a single session with you? And he asked me one question, which is the thing that's so beautiful about coaching. It's all about, and it doesn't have to be a long, elaborate question. Sometimes it's four words. Anyway, he said, if you could have anyone's job in the world, whose would you have? I never, I'll never forget it. And I couldn't yeah. answer that question and I'm not good with names. So I said, I love the question, but I'm going to change it. If I could do any job in the world, what would I do? And I started listing, like, I love public speaking and I, I have a heart of encouragement. People always come to me and I love guiding and I love that kind of interaction. And, and at the end of this conversation, he said, you just described a life coach. Hmm. And I was like, hmm. And, and, and then slowly I started researching coaching programs. And then as soon as I decided life coaching is about transitions, I was like, okay, child of divorce, adult of divorce, I guess I'll go into divorce coaching. Yeah. And I just knew it right away. <laughs> yeah. You're like, I kind of know a, a thing or two about that. Yeah. Been there. When did, um, when did that dark cloud lift for you after like when you were going through your divorce or maybe it was after the divorce, like when did you like, ah, you know, breathe? 
I think that uh, one of the things I did early on, before I think I even told my spouse I wanted a divorce, was I I joined Al Anon, uh, mm, my, nice. my and and ACOA. So my dad was an alcoholic. My my spouse had a different substance of preference, but mm-hmm. Al Anon felt right for me. And and Al Anon was so incredible because it just has these tenants like you know, keep the focus on yourself, keep your side of the street clean, don't don't go to his side of the street, how important is it one day at a time, like when you start going through all of the sayings and slogans and concepts, it really helped me through Mm -hmm. my divorce to stay in hope. And it also, and I I talk about this in, in the summit, I was raised Roman Catholic, but and and no offense to any Roman Catholic, mm-hmm. I always felt like the priest and the bishop and the pope and a bunch of other people were between me and the big guy. Yeah, <laughs> program. And they're like, talk to your higher power. So now I'm a Christian, and there's there, those people aren't in between me and God. But that was <laughs> another piece of it was me finding my spiritual foundation and leaning mm. into a power greater than me. And, and all of those leaps of faith where I had no choice, but to trust one of the things, my ex, I was always a working mom. So mm. unlike many women who get really scared, I knew I can make a living. Like that's yeah. not my bigger fear. And he worked from home. So he, he pitched to everybody that he was the primary parent and I was going to lose custody. Mm -hmm. And now, even as I say it, it's so silly, but when he said it, I believed it a hundred percent. I was scared, Mm. you know, I was scared out of my wits that I would lose my kids. So, so the dark tunnel kind of would ebb and flow depending on what I was dealing with. The minute I moved out of the house, Custody had mostly been agreed to. We were both walking away with like a ridiculous amount of debt. It wasn't like there was anything positive yeah. coming out of that end. When by that point, I was a different person. So, so at somewhere along the journey, I just felt like I became more and more confident in who I was. And when I started, mm-hmm. I was my therapist said to me, You are a shell of the Mm. woman I met a year ago. And when she had met me a year ago, I was in pretty bad shape. So I was, I was as broken as any human being I've ever coached. Mm. I love that you were so proactive in your healing, you know, like, I mean, I feel like even before it got really bad, before you got really, really broken, I think that's probably what saved you the most. Well, it was my daughter's two-year birthday. Um, so so my son and daughter are about two years apart. So by her two-year birthday, I mean, that, that was 2000. We, we were married six years, six quick years. And uh, and that was the day I knew. Uh, I, I actually had a physical altercation with my husband that I began. Mm-hmm. I was fully responsible for it. It was mm-hmm. very scary. And I went upstairs. He took the kids and left because mom's a raging lunatic and nobody's safe around her. And I went upstairs and I looked in the mirror and I would always refer to my mom as a rageaholic. My dad was an mm. alcoholic. My mom was a rageaholic. And I looked in the mirror and she was staring back at me. And I just lost. Ah. It was like, how, how in God's name did you end up here so quickly? Mm. And the next day I called a therapist. And I just thought, I knew he had a boatload of issues that I didn't like. But when I looked in the mirror, I was like, I can do something about that. (laughs) Yeah, you're exactly right. Wow. What, um, what is it? Clear, confident, calm, clear, calm, clear, and confident, calm, clear, and confident. Let's dive into those. Yeah. So, well, Um, I mean, you're living in chaos, anyone who's yeah. living. And and I would love to just say to the audience, I am not a big fan of a lot of the uh, narrative out there that uh, everyone's a narcissist and narcissists are evil, you know, uh, vile individuals and all of this. Uh, the truth is, in, especially in today's day and age, mm. we are all traumatized. And so many of us come from trauma Many narcissists come from trauma. Um, Mm -hmm. Certainly the codependents who are attracted to them come from trauma. 
um, there is, I think there's this, this dangerous uh, diminishing of mental health because the other one is like uh, borderline personality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you have a spouse with mental health challenges and you have children who've been raised mm-hmm. under them, chances are your children are going to have mental health challenges. Right. And so you, what you say so vilely about your spouse, uh, you may be dealing with that exact same situation with a human being that you've brought into the world. And so, so I, I would say that, you know, I have a lot of compassion for my ex these days and he hasn't Mm -hmm. changed at all. And he's incredibly displeasing to be in relationship with, but it breaks Mm -hmm. my heart because I fell in love with a part of him. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. and He can't hold that. And Mm -hmm. so, so he doesn't, so he has a life that I feel is really lonely and small and mm. um and I wouldn't wish that on anyone and so I think that um I think that we need to keep in mind that there's a lot of trauma and a lot of what do they call it neurodiversion these days a lot yeah. of mental health challenges yeah. and uh lowering our judgment and raising our curiosity would be a really wise thing for us as a society yeah I agree. And I, I think that like our um, most complicated relationships or most challenging people in our lives are our greatest teachers. Uh, and I was going to ask you, actually, uh, you've been taking the words out of my mouth so many times. I'm like, uh, no, I don't know what to <laughs> say because you already said it. I was like, dang it. But um, yes, I've been to Al-Anon and actually my brother he died of addiction about four years ago. Oh, so and funny. yeah, and the first time he went into a coma, this was like my greatest, like I could cry in this moment because this is where everything really changed for me in my life and me as a person. Um, but I can, I'll never forget stepping over that threshold walking into his hospital room and seeing him, he's like six foot five, hooked up to all these machines. And at the time, let's see, he would have been 46 years old. And I can remember like just seeing him as a soul with a body, not a body with a soul, if that makes sense. Mm. Not seeing him like with the label of an addict or a narcissist or whatever labels are attached to him or a rageaholic, an alcoholic, a drug addict, all of those labels just fell to the floor. And I could finally like just, I had so much compassion for him. I was like, God, this poor, poor guy has been struggling to get through this lifetime. Yeah. And he just doesn't know. And so relating that to like to your husband, your ex-husband, to other people in your life and my life and other people's lives that you really have to go below the surface. You got to remove those labels. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it okay. That doesn't mean just because you have compassion and you might forgive that person, that doesn't mean you got to like be married to them or go out for lunch with them. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, I would say that if you're in a high conflict marriage right now, um, compassion is not the first thing to grab for. In fact, (laughs) anger is much better because it will move you. Um, Compassion could end up being that slippery codependent slope to staying. Yep. So I think that, uh, you know, what the first time I was running groups years back and I brought up the F word forgiveness. I, I I thought everyone in the room was going to like throw something at me. And it's so it's very important to be sensitive to the fact that when you've been beaten verbally, emotionally, maybe physically belittled, berated, um, that is not the time to mm-hmm. be trying to find compassion for the person who's harmed you. That's the time mm-hmm. to actually find self-compassion because I can guarantee you what's going on in your head is nasty. What the heck is my problem? Why did I stay Mm -hmm. here? How did I even don't do that to yourself? Be self-compassionate. So we're going to talk about compassion and that's your position 
right now. Um, go for self-compassion over anything else. Yeah. And I think the same way that you and I were looking back at like, what would we have said to ourselves back then? You know, maybe if you are going through, you know, a, a complicated divorce right now, then think, what would you want your future self to look like, feel like, think, how would they, what would they be saying to you? And yeah, like you have to become like your own, your own coach, your own therapist, your, your own best friend. And, and look at yourself in the mirror and go, you got this, like we can do this. Yeah. 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 And, and I think the other thing when it comes to these high conflict situations is, you know, we didn't, accidentally stumble into this. We were, yeah. we were predisposed because whatever happens in that childhood uh, family of origin, intimate relationship with mom, dad, and the kids that's implanted. And yeah. our subconscious, I was like, my funny thing is I will never marry an alcoholic. And my dad was a very jolly drunk. He was my favorite of the two <laughs> parents. Nice guy. Um, I will never marry an alcoholic. So I, I married a waker and wake and bake pot smoker. And somehow I thought that was different because yeah. that's how enlightened I was back then. <laughs> uh, you know, speaking of al um, one of the things that got me through that time and still does actually um, is the, the serenity prayer. Oh. And it's like my favorite. I mean, I have to remind myself of it all the time. Like if I'm going through something, I'm like, okay, girl, what can you control? But, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of goes back to being proactive and doing what you can. Um, but at the same time, staying calm through it, like staying calm. But also I love what you said earlier about anger, because, um, as you probably know, this, like every emotion, um, has a, uh, like a frequency, a vibration. Interestingly, anger is higher than sadness and depression. Yes. Anger can make you move. Like, yeah. And, and I've always said something like, um, sometimes you got to get pissed to get passionate. Absolutely. Because when yeah. you are feeling like a victim and you're just crushed, it's you've got nothing. You're you're like yeah. you're barely vibrating. And and yeah. anger is a kick up from that. And so mm -hmm. absolutely. And so the calm is if you've been living in chaos. When when I first went my first Al Anon meeting, they said the serenity prayer. And I turned to my girlfriend and I was like, what does that even mean? That was like what I said. Like I literally had no concept of calm and serenity. And I was like, yeah. oh, it's, it's probably a red flag right there. <laughs> Remember on uh, Seinfeld, like George was like, serenity now. Do you yeah. <laughs> like, serenity now, I can't take it. <laughs> so um, clear, what is, tell me about clear. It's it's very, what what happens in both external and internal is incredibly chaotic and murky and the thought of going into a divorce there's um confusion there's uncertainty and so when we can help our 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 followers get calm and then begin to experience that clarity of i mean a perfect example is should i stay or should i go yeah like it's the hardest decision mm -hmm. to make and yet what I find when I coach people is they know the answer. Yeah. It, but the reason it's not clear is because it's veiled in fear and uncertainty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like when I say, okay, so let's, let's put you in a bubble of safety. Let's just imagine whatever you decide to do, you're going to be okay. Your kids are going to be okay. There's not going to be any like severe negative impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well then I would leave. Um, so it's like, so, so clarity is, um, is key because it helps you say, well, well, what's murky that's, that's keeping me stuck. Right. And so it's almost like one step at a time, you just keep finding clarity over and over again. And then, and then you have a next step. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think for me as well, um, even after the divorce, cause my life was such a mess, it was getting more clear on 
windy on what I, what I wanted, who I wanted to be. And, and kind of like, I don't like to say peel the um, layers of the onion. Cause you don't really get to much when you get to the center, but <laughs> I'd rather peel the onion or peel the layers of an artichoke. Right. Then you get to the heart, but <laughs> oh my God, I love that. You like that? I know. And, but, but it's true. Cause I felt like so much of me had, had been covered up over the decades, whether it was from childhood, um, you know, from my relationship with my brother, from the exes and, oh my gosh, like there was in the trauma and the drama. And I was like, where's Wendy? Where did she go? So I think it was trying to get clear on, on who I wanted to be and what I wanted my future to look like, even if it wasn't completely clear, just to have an idea. And yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Well, I, I, you know, I, one of the reasons I, I love the name of my company. And and one of the reasons is as I was trying to figure out, like, how do I title this thing I'm going to do? Clarity is a journey. Acceptance is a journey. Forgiveness is a journey. Compassion is a journey. It's all a damn journey. Like none of it's a one and done kind of thing. And so, so, so you get clear and then and then as in yoga, you reach your edge and it's like, I can't go any further. I'm murky again. Yep. And so you get clear and then you go further. And I think yep. that that's how it unfolds. For me, I the the one thing I knew was I didn't marry you for your money. I, I can, I, I'm not saying I can make a lot of money, but I can certainly support myself and the kids. Mm-hmm. And so, so that was a, that was a great clarity to have. It was, it was the external to my household that I probably felt the most confident about, even though I had lost all my sales and I had no money, I knew it was because I was just an emotional mess. And so, so the clarity, and I think I would say, because my mom just recently passed, I just had a big move. Mm. I had some issues with my adult kids. So I think that the clarity is always so key to be Mm. able to make the right conscious and intentional steps going forward. Yeah. Otherwise we're operating, you know, we're just throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what, what sticks. Yeah. That's not a good approach. Well, even before we started recording, uh, we were talking about business and things like that. It's kind of the same thing. Sometimes you have to stop, reset, regroup, um, gain clarity on like, okay, what's next. Yeah. And, and to be uh, okay with you pivot when you need to pivot. It doesn't mean that like, oh my God, I took this job. I shouldn't have taken this job. I hate this job. Like, well, you can quit, you know, like you're not stuck with anything or anyone or anywhere. Like you can pivot when you need to pivot. And really, I think it comes down to just trusting yourself again. I mean, I didn't, I didn't trust myself with any, like even the dumbest decisions. I was like, well, I didn't, I've made that mistake. I'm probably going to make another one. It was like, boo hoo, woe is me. I was like, all right, enough. (laughs) Like, let's just, yeah. And and I mean, I think that brings us to the confidence piece too. Yeah. Was living in a high conflict marriage, you, you, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of confusion. And it's very hard to tune into your whisper of intuition when there's this screaming, yelling, fear voice telling you, stranger danger, there's a bear is going to eat you, you know? And so you're so flooded with cortisol and you're living out of your amygdala and all of that needs to quiet down so that you can actually tune into that wisdom, that soul in a body that you talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. which we all have, and we all have access to the wisdom, but I didn't because yeah. because the volume was on a hundred for my fear and on zero for my intuition. And I didn't even know that. Like I wasn't aware that that's what I was missing. But I think part of pivoting to confident is really challenging the fear story. And and you know, we were just talking about business. I got a lot of fear stories around my business. I had a lot yep. of fear stories around leaving my marriage, fear stories around being able to raise my kids or whatever. And so that has to be quieted down so that we can actually tap into that beautiful wisdom, which is always going to guide us. So yeah, perfectly. how how do you turn the volume down on that 
that nagging voice in your head. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first thing is, uh, whose is it? That's one of my first yeah. questions is whose voice is that? So often we're operating based on beliefs that belong to our parents, our religion, our culture, our ancestors, and we just do it. So it's just yeah. like, okay, that's the blueprint. That's where I'm going. And then it's like, well, slow down. Whose voice? Do you believe that? Yeah. And it's amazing to watch somebody begin to deconstruct. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, I don't really believe that. So that's the beginning of it. And then the other part of it. So that's one part. But another part is fear is like a circus mirror. It's like and it's on steroids. And so the the acronym for fear is um, false evidence appearing real. Right. Yep. But there's also. A, a good example in high conflict divorces, I'm going to end up in the street with my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is, yeah. How likely is it? Yeah. <laughs> like, is this true? Yeah. Well, I might have to go live it with my mother. Okay. First of all, would you prefer the street or your mother? Let's just. <laughs> I'll know? take the street. No. <laughs> and, and then, and, and so then when you get to the end of that conversation, mm -hmm. Instead of the fear being this, the fear is like, oh, okay, I I'm yeah. afraid that I might not be able to make my bills. And so that calms things down and that quiets down the fear. So I think it's it's approaching it from whatever those couple of different angles are. And then if you can work with someone who can just, okay, I want you to sit and breathe. And how does that feel in your body now? It's like, oh my mm. God, it's like I'm so much calmer. Like, okay, great. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to die. And, and now can you tap into, and now can we, you know, tune into what is your heart telling you? What is your spirit telling? What is your wiser self? What do you know? Yeah. You're afraid to know it maybe, but you actually know it. And that's where we all have it. And it begins mm. to come to the surface. Yeah. And I think also, yeah, very well said. And I think um, you have to kind of experiment um, like with what brings you some, some, uh, some silence and peace. Um, for me, I started walking. Um, sometimes I would listen to podcasts or listen to music or then eventually no music. Um, journaling. I started journaling every single morning. Um, I would literally just like make a cup of coffee. I grab my journal and a pen and I would just, I would just write. I would not process. I would not, you know, um, filter just whatever went onto the paper, went onto the paper. I'd close the journal and that was it. But it's just getting those thoughts and feelings out. Yeah. And then sometimes like I'd noticed later in the day, I'd be like, that's kind of silly. I was writing about that. I was like, oh my God, like I'm so, I'm so whiny, you know, like, oh my gosh. Yeah. But it's, it's interesting when you do start to listen to those voices and we all have them. You're not crazy if you have different voices in your head, you know, uh, or is it just me? Tell me, Karen, is it just me? No, sorry. <laughs> but I think it's like you it's human experience. Like, yeah, exactly. But you either have like your best friend or your biggest enemy. And the key is, is to, to really start to listen and pay attention. and eventually turn down the volume of that enemy and turn up like your best friend going, yes, girl, you're like your cheerleader. You got this. Like, of course you can do this. Like, of course you're not going to be living on the street. You got this. So it's, um, it takes time. Just like you were saying earlier, it's a journey. It's a process. It's not overnight. And um, we have an inner critic. I think that part yeah. of it is we all have an inner critic. And one yeah. of the things I, I love talking to my clients about is you know, our inner critic came from our childhood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so if, and so careful what you say to your children. Yeah. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. so, why do you always have to be so blank? Blank. And, yeah. And, and so mm -hmm. I think that my inner, my, my mom was critical and mm -hmm. my inner critic, even after I divorced my, my husband, um, and and I was smart enough to evict him from my head. Right? Mm. Key thing. Oh, and evict, I love that. You have to evict your spouse from. They're taking up all this real estate. There's no space for you, and that's why you can't hear your own thoughts. 
But then when I did hear my own thoughts, they were just nasty. And so then I had to do that work of, well, wait a second, whose voice is that? Who's speaking those things? Is that my truth? Is that what I believe about me or my situation? So, you know, one of the things I talk about at the summit and in my keynote is, and I think that you could relate to this, going from the marriage isn't what I thought it would be, or it's a big fat problem to I'm ready to leave is this enormous journey that really takes place between our ears and as we travel down to our heart. And it could take months, it could take years. And that is the beginning of the journey because there's so much we have to untangle and dismantle so that we can be calm, clear, and confident, and so that we could then actually be effective and productive in the divorce process itself. Mm, perfect. I hope that, is that in your keynote? Well, it should be, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be on Instagram on Thursday. So. <laughs> I, I was trying so hard not to go, mm-hmm, because I was like, that's good, that's good. So good. <laughs> yes, very well said. Uh, Is it worth it? Is it worth the whole journey and the process? You know, my, what I, I called my best friend, I think I had moved into the new place and I said, I am so bloody happy with myself that if Mm. I had to go through the last three and a half years all over again, I would do it on a dime to be the person I am today. So, and that's a pretty big statement because it was a pretty hard ride, but and then in on my podcast, we have series, as I had mentioned to you, and one is called Voices of Celebration. Ah. I don't know, maybe I have two or three dozen people on there. Every one mm. of them tell the same story, men and women. Mm. This was the most devastating, worst thing that ever could have happened to me. And it's turned out to be the best thing that happened. Yeah. Every single one of them, very different journeys. And yet, Each of now, these are people who hired a coach and Mm -hmm. did the work, but but they used they used the pain to fuel the transformation. Yeah. And they're all in this great place. And it doesn't mean life is perfect. I mean, there's still troubles, but they have a toolbox, they're Mm -hmm. a version of themselves. And geez, if you could get through the transition of divorce, there's not too many transitions that trump that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, divorce can teach you quite a bit about yourself. And the 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 end result is, can be amazing. Can be if you if you make it that way. You have to work it. You have to work mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Tell us about the summit. Yeah, so thank you so much for uh, inviting me to do that. So what what I decided to do was because high conflict divorce has so many other players involved. And because people come to it so unhinged and triggered and overwhelmed, I wanted to honor the complexity of it. And so I reached out to 20 of the experts across the country. And so I have an attorney from Blank Rome who's talking about being the lead attorney. I've got an attorney for the children. I've got custody evaluators. I have financial people and financial Mm -hmm. forensics. I have individuals who help people do pro se, which is to represent yourself in court. Mm-hmm. Um, I have this woman who is an adult survivor of parental alienation, which is such a huge cutting edge problem. Oh, yes. I just spoke. I had a guest on the show the other day. That same type of thing happened to her. Yeah. Awful. Yeah. Oh horrendous. It's like the worst of child abuse. And so what I've tried to create is uh, I have Kate Anthony, who is this just brilliant woman who, who, who supports women in deciding whether to stay or go. And so we've created this roster that takes you through every expert you might need to hire. So it's in a way, if people attend, they're going to literally get thousands of dollars worth of consultations for free because the summit is free. And, and I mean, I am blown away by every interview I've done. I only have two left to do. So it's like every, uh, Bill Eddy, the, the, the 
pioneer of high conflict personalities. He was like so good. I wanted to talk to him for three hours. And so the summit is set up to educate mm. and guide and um, and encourage these mm. people who are facing this mammoth task ahead of them to have the tools and the wisdom to do it well. And I'm so excited for it. Ah, I love it. And, you know, I think the greatest thing is just knowing you're not alone. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason that there's so much, so many resources out there now to help people through divorce and it does make it so much easier. And it's not, I think that so often we step into it like I failed, which, yeah. which makes sense. Oh. I think on the face of it, I failed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's not a failure. And it's actually such an overcoming um, yeah. when you can do this work and emerge on the other side. And the thing that I always feel like I, I want to share is that if you ended up in a high conflict marriage, then you've come from disorder, dysfunction, toxic childhood. And the opportunity to break generational chains and make life better for your children, your grandchildren, and your great grandchildren require you to be bold and brave enough to stop and then take everything. And I mean, everything you've learned and pour it into your kids, be, be the best so that they pour it into their kids. And so that the the chains are of a positive instead of a brokenness. Yeah. Breaking the cycle. I love it. So how do they sign up for the summit? So the summit is completely free. It's November 13th to 17th. And uh, if you go to um, journey beyond divorce backslash summit 2023, you can sign up for free. It's on this really fun platform that has a lot of engagement and interaction. And, and we've, we're giving out points and we're raffling off gifts. We've got coaching sessions and free books. Ah. And, and so we're really trying to create an entire experience so that people, the idea is you may feel stuck now by the end of the summit, you're going to feel in momentum. You're going to feel like you're gaining traction, that you have plans. There's actually a mission statement that we ask everyone to agree to in the beginning, mm. as to what they're going to get out of the five days. It's a five day power guide through the hardest transition you're facing. And um, yeah, so journeybeyonddivorce.com backslash summit 2023 and, and, and it's free. And then we have the opportunity to have it for a lifetime for uh, a very small fee. So uh, people I love have- it. So then that's, um, so they can say, oh, okay, what did I say? This, this show will come out on Thursday. So they'll have time to sign up. Absolutely. Well, do it right now. Yeah. Do it right away. <laughs> do it right, do it right away. Because you know, every every right. day is every day is up for 24 yeah. hours. So oh, nice. we're trying to give people. So there's four interviews a day. There's one or two bonuses, but there's four interviews a day. And you have 24 hours to listen. And then if they're really valuable and you know that you're not absorbing it all, you can you can choose to upgrade and and then you have the whole platform the for whole, life. The whole kit and caboodle. Nice. And then, uh, so we can also find you at what journeybeyonddivorce.com journeybeyonddivorce.com. The summit is called the ultimate high conflict divorce summit. Uh, you can go to journey beyond divorce where my, um, podcast and Mm -hmm. listen to our podcast. We've been talking a lot about high conflict divorce lately to, to prime everyone. Yeah. I love it. You're so great. I'm so glad I had you back a second time. I think we'll, we'll have you back a third time and a fourth. Well, well, and 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 we should do some swaps too. I would love to get I know. you to come over and talk to my people as well. Yeah, I would love that. You're yeah. so great. I, you. I feel like we're uh, we're yeah. like kindred spirits or something. We, we're connected we somehow. We can chat all day. <laughs> all right, thank you so much, everyone, and I will leave everything in the show notes for you in case you forgot everything. Okay, thank you. Have a great day. Did this podcast inspire you, challenge you, trigger you to make a change or spit out your coffee laughing? Good. Then there are three ways you can thank me. Number one, 
You can leave a written review of this podcast on Apple iTunes. Number two, you can take a screenshot of the episode and share it on the social media and tag me, Wendy Valentine. Number three, share it with another midlifer that needs a makeover. You know who I'm talking about. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Get out there and be bold, be free, be you.